Hi guys, this is Howard Eamon. I'm the Beat Your Course Applied Mathematics 1413 instructor here at Western University. I will be uh, doing a review session on December 8th and 9th from 3.45 p.m. to 9.45 p.m. in the afternoon. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I'm an Ontario certified high school math teacher and currently I'm an occasional teacher at the International Test Pilot School. It's called ITPS um, here in London, Ontario. Uh, it's an engineering firm. They teach uh, students how to fly airplanes and they've hired me to teach them mathematics and statistics. Okay, so the way I teach is I try to bring examples that try to connect uh, different units uh, you see in class usually everything's taught in separate units and uh, you can't really see any connections so it always feels, feels that there's more information than there really is. So I try to connect them and that way you're learning much more in a shorter period of time. What your professors uh, take three hours a week to teach you, I will uh, teach it to you in an hour and you will learn it so much better. Uh, just as an example, uh, one day one of my students uh, at the pilot school, he came up to me and he said, uh, Sir, uh, what you've taught me in four weeks took my professors in Korea the entire semester to teach. So that's, that's the way I, I try to teach. And I've also private tutored over a thousand students uh, today, to, up to today. And I can tell you that more than half of them tell me mathematics has become their favorite subject. I hope to see uh, many of you for our final review session because it's going to uh, help you learn uh, math, enjoy it, and cut down a lot on your study so that you can focus on your other courses and do better in your other courses as well as learn mathematics from a professional. Uh, you can watch my sample lesson on the related rates and an example with optimization uh, to see if you like my teaching style. I'm confident you will like it and I hope to see uh, as many of you as possible uh, at our review session so that uh, I can help you, all of you, uh, enjoy mathematics. See you soon. In this lesson I will be going over related rates and optimization. So a lot of students find these two topics quite difficult. In related rates, we look at how variables change over time. We are not concerned about making a variable into a, a maximum or a minimum. Uh, in the, these kind of word problems, we have constants and variables. The variables change over time. But there is no mention about a maximum or a minimum. And because our variables will be functions of time, we will be using implicit differentiation. In optimization, we often don't look at time as a variable whatsoever. And even if we do, we are more concerned about trying to make a specific variable y into a maximum uh, given a sp another variable x. So we try to pick the value of x that makes y into a, either a maximum or a minimum. With related rates, it's okay to have multiple variables. With optimization, you can start with multiple variables, but you have to be able to eliminate most of them except two. So that way you could reduce it down to a problem with relating x to y, and then you try to vary x to the point where you can find the maximum or minimum of y. In optimization, we often set the derivative to zero because that's where we will find out uh, y is at its maximum or minimum. So more on that later. Let's now talk uh, more in detail about related rates. Related rates are word problems in which we are looking at rates of change of all the variables and they are all uh, re related to one another. In calculus, the word for a rate is the derivative, so we'll be looking for derivatives. The most important thing with related rates is to identify your constants and your variables you will be substituting all of the constants into the equation before you take the derivative, which in calculus we say is differentiate. Okay, so it's quite important that you identify what your constants and what your variables are 
because those that vary over time they will remain as variables until after you take the derivative those that will not be changing over time you have to substitute in their values immediately if you want to get the right solution implicit differentiation will come up quite often in related rates so these are two important formulas that we will be using so you remember when we did the derivative of y to the power of n with respect to x we said you use the power rule n y to the power n minus 1 but then you have to also do the chain rule multiplied by dy dt and the idea was that y was a function of x and in this case I'm just making it a function of t because that's what we will see in related rates so let me just explain the idea here let's say your y is 2t minus 1 to the power of 3 if you were to take the derivative here you would say 3 times 2t minus 1 to the power of 3 minus 1 times the derivative of the inside which you would know is 2 if you had let's say sine t to the power of 3 when you do the derivative you would say 3 sine t squared times the derivative of sine t which is cos t right so that's what we're doing here it's just that we don't know what the function uh, y is right so this could be like the function y that I'm representing in the formula here for implicit differentiation I don't know what the function y looks like so I can't say that the derivative is either a 2 or a, sine, a cos t or some other unknown function that's why we just leave it as dy dt and if you have a constant multiplied by y to the n you will be using this other formula here and what this formula says is you leave the constant c in front and you take care of the derivative of y to the n by just bringing the power down y to the power n minus 1 and then multiply by the derivative of y with respect to the variable t let's do a couple of examples here suppose that the area of a circle is growing at 18 pi squared meters per second find the rate at which the radius is changing when the radius is 3 so I want to draw a couple of pictures I want to know what my variables are and what my constants are so we have a little circle here in the first picture and who knows a couple of seconds later or sometime after this circle will be growing and we know that the area of a circle is pi r squared so we have to ask over time as this circle gets bigger what are your constants and what are your variables in this equation right pi is not going to change if we look at one circle to the next we see that it's actually uh, growing in both radius the radius r is growing and so is the area let's say this is a small area and it becomes a bigger area right here so both of them a and r are variables and I've said that when you have variables you don't sub in their values until the last step so let's write this equation again and we're going to take the derivative of both sides with respect to time okay the left side you can't really do much about it it's da dt the right side pi is a constant so when you have a constant we leave the constant there we take the derivative of r squared which is going to be 2 r to the power of 1 times the derivative of r which we will say is dr dt okay at this point I'm ready to sub in all the values that I know so let's go back see what we know the area is growing at a uh, rate of 18 pi squared meters per second so that's da dt 18 pi find the rate at which the radius is changing so find dr dt right a rate in calculus is a derivative when the radius is 3 so that's what I'm going to do now 
replace da dt by 18 pi and replace r with a 3. So let's do that here. So I have 18 pi is equal to pi times 2r dr dt. And now I can rearrange it. 18 pi equals 6 pi dr dt. Divide both sides by 6 pi. And you get dr dt is equal to 3. And of course the units, units of radius uh, are in meters. So meters per second. Okay. So this would tell us that every second the radius is growing at 3 meters per second. Okay, so I hope this is quite clear. Let's do a more difficult question. A liquid is added to a cylindrical can at the rate of 2 cubic centimeters per second. So right away you want to write down what uh, that represents. It's a rate, so we know a rate equals a derivative. But what is, the, what is it a derivative of, right? Cubic units per second, that's a volume. So we are told dv dt. And since we are adding to this cylindrical can, it's going to be a positive value. Okay, uh, the can has a height of four and a diameter of six. Diameter of six implies that your radius is equal to three. How fast is the depth of water rising after eight seconds? So let me draw again two pictures to show what's happening to the amount of liquid in the cylindrical can over time. So initially, we can pretend that we have no liquid in this can. Right, a couple of seconds later, we have some liquid in it. So I'm just going to do this in a different color. So here's a little bit of liquid. And uh, let's maybe do one more picture. Let's have a look. And of course, with uh, these related rates problems, they're actually not that hard if you know uh, what's going on. Okay, so let's add some more liquid. Here we go. So you have to ask yourself what is changing from picture to picture, right? So if we define V to be the volume of the liquid, then we can see that uh, it's occupying more space from picture to picture. So that's going to be one of our variables, right? So one of your variables is uh, V. The equation for volume in a cylinder is pi r squared h, v equals pi r squared h. So you can see again that uh, from first to second to third picture, the height has also increased. Right, so this is the small height, and now it's a bigger height. So here's where, here's where you don't want to get confused. They gave you the height of the cylinder, that's great. But that's not going to be useful for us to solve this problem. It's not, we're not trying to measure the height of the cylinder, we're trying to measure the height of the liquid. Okay, what about the radius? So think about this, if we, when we go from the first to the second to the third picture. Does the radius change or does it remain constant? Well, if you look at it, I have this as my radius. But in the third picture, it's the same. So your radius is not a variable. Radius is a constant. And the radius of the liquid is going to be the same as the radius of the cylinder. Right? There's your radius. It's going to be 3 centimeters. And that's the key to this question, is that by knowing that the radius is a constant, you need to go to the volume equation and substitute in the value of R immediately. If you forget to do that, you will not get the right answer. So you want to go here and replace R with a 3 
before you take any derivatives. And look at this. Easy equation now to differentiate. So let's do this here. So dv dt, take the derivative of both sides, d by dt of the function 9 pi h, right? Remember that 9 pi is a constant, and the derivative of a constant is just, uh, if it were to be on its own, it's zero. But if it's attached to a variable, then you leave it there, and you take the derivative of the uh, other variable. Common mistake here. So typically, students would say that the derivative is 1. Okay? So you don't want to do that here. h is not a variable just like, a, like x that you've usually seen. In fact, we can think of h as h of t, that it's a function of time. So when we say dh dt for the derivative, we can just say, think of it as h prime t. Right? So h is a function of time, so you don't say that the derivative is 1, otherwise you'd be saying that no matter what function h is, its derivative will always be 1. But think about it. h could easily be sine t or t squared minus 3. Who knows? It's just some random uh, function that you don't know. So for that reason, we can't say the derivative is 1. We just say dh dt because we don't know what the derivative of one of these uh, random functions would be, right? So now that, we're, that we have this equation, I can go back and replace dv dt by 2. And you're easily able to isolate for dh dt. Okay, divide both sides by 9 pi. So you get dh dt is 2 over 9 pi meters per second, right? Sorry, centimeters per second. There. Okay, so let's try, let's make a, let me go back and uh, talk about a couple of things, right? So we drew a couple of pictures to find out what's changing over time. Because, because things that don't change over time, they become constants, so their derivatives, um, the, before we do the derivatives, we have to substitute in their values. And that's what we did with R. We said that the radius is a constant at the value of 3, so we plugged it in here immediately before we did the derivative. By doing that, it made our life uh, analysis a lot easier, right? So we did dv dt is equal to, and we did the derivative of 9 pi h, which uh, you should think of it as this formula here that I had, right, all the way in this page. That if you have a constant times a variable to a power, this is what you do. You don't just say the derivative is 1. You have to actually do think of h as a function of time. Okay, and then we rearranged it. And one more comment here. Notice that the 8 seconds in the question did not have uh, any, did not serve any purpose. Right, I did not use it. And in fact, that's, that's what could happen on your exam. There was no, no need to use a value of 8 seconds. And the reason was because the, the volume is increasing at a constant rate. So quite often in related rates, time, the time itself doesn't have much meaning in solving for the rates of the other variables. Okay, let's do uh, one more question that tends to often come up on exams. So we have a tank of water in the shape of a cone and it's leaking water at a constant rate of two cubic, two cubic feet per minute, right? So that's the rate of volume. But this time it's leaking water. So the amount of water is going down. And therefore the derivative is actually negative two. Okay, and that's because it's leaking. So the amount of water remaining in the cone is uh, going down over time. The base diameter of the tank, so I want to actually draw a picture here. So we have a cone. The base diameter of the tank, so the diameter right here, is 8 feet. 
and the height of the tank is 6 feet. At what rate is the depth of the water? So depth of the water is measured by the height of the water. So what is the rate of the depth of the water? In other words, what is the derivative of the height of the water with respect to time when the depth of the water h is equal to 4 feet? That's what we want to find out. So again, let's come up with an equation, talk about what our variables are, what our constants are, and then we'll go from there. So volume of a cone is one-third pi r squared h. And actually, you should be able to look at this and see a connection between the volume of a cone and the volume of a cylinder. Right? The volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. And volume of a cone is one-third pi r squared h. Right? That's because a cone is actually one-third of a cylinder. So I don't know if any of you have noticed that. But I can actually insert three equal cones in here. And uh, that would be, uh, that would fit an entire cylinder. So that's, what I could, that's why the formula is one-third of it. Okay, I'm just going to uh, delete this so it doesn't get confusing. But that's where the formula comes from. Let's write down our variables and our constants. So in this equation, as the uh, cone is losing water, right? So there's the amount of water. Let's draw a second picture. Which of the variables are changing? We know for f we know that uh, pi is a constant, but we know that uh, the amount of water in the cone is less, so there's less volume. Volume will be changing. We also can see that the height of the water is uh, going down, so h is also a variable. Notice also that the radius is changing. So here we had a radius r, and now we have a smaller radius. So r is also a variable in this question. So we're not allowed to plug in the values of r, v, or h before we take the derivative. Okay, there's one other thing that you have to know about cones, and this is the uh, practically the only shape in this course that you have to know uh, to use similar triangles. Okay, so we actually have similar triangles. So we have uh, initially when the tank is filled up, we have a height of six feet a diameter of 8, or you can think of it as a radius of 4, but in any case, diameter of 8. And then when the triangle gets smaller, right, as the cone, the amount of water in the cone occupies less space, then now you have some variable height and variable diameter. So height is h, and the diameter could be called 2r. It's better to think of it as 2R because if you look at the volume equation, it has R and H. So using it as a diameter would not serve us a good purpose. So with similar triangles, how it works is you can divide the ratios of similar sides and they're going to be equal. So I could do 8 over 2R and that's going to equal 6 over H. Okay, this equation allows me to solve for either r in terms of h or h in terms of r. So you got to make a decision here. Which of these variables would you like to replace? Let's go back to uh, the question. Right, so we want to know at what rate is the depth of the water uh, in the tank changing. So this is what you're trying to find. So based on that, if you want to find the derivative of h, you should keep h, and you should be replacing r. And that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so r equals 8h over 12, divide both sides by 4, you get 2h over 3. So let's do that now. Go to the volume equation. 
and replace the R with two-thirds of the height. Okay, at this point, it's very tempting. Students quite often try to take the derivative as early as possible because the computations can get uh, quite messy, right? But it's important to actually to not do that. You want to simplify this as much as possible. It's a good investment. Take your time, try to simplify your function as much as you can, and then take the derivative. So I'll show you what I mean here. I'm going to uh, expand everything. So I get uh, 4 over 9 h squared h. And then I'm going to multiply the constants together. So I get 4 over 27 pi h cubed. Right now, this will be very easy to do uh, as a derivative. We have a constant that is multiplied by uh, h cubed. So when we do the derivative, we will leave the constant 4 over 27 pi, and it will take the derivative of h cubed. So let's differentiate both sides with respect to time. Okay, so on the right side I can show this. All right. 4 over 27 pi is a constant. I leave it. Derivative of h cubed, right? Let me just do that in blue. That's going to be 3h squared multiplied by dh dt. You always want to carry this uh, with related rates. So let's simplify. So I have dv dt is equal to 12 pi over 27 h squared dh dt. Okay, I can rearrange for dh dt. So you have 27 multiplied by dv dt all over 12 pi h squared. Wonderful, right? So I, I cross multiplied, I multiplied the 27 over to the left side, and then I divide it by 12 pi h squared. Okay, at this point it's easy to do. We sub in the values of dv dt, which we said is negative 2, and we sub in the value of h, right? We had asked at what rate is the uh, depth of the water changing when the height is 4. So I'm going to change the h into a 4. And that's it. So now it's simple algebra. You would simplify and that would give you your answer. And that's all you would have to do here. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. This is a cone. So uh, similar triangles do come up in cones. We need them because there was no information about how fast the radius is changing, okay? So when I went to uh, down here to use similar triangles, I was able to come up with an expression for r in terms of h. I subbed in that into the equation here. I, I applied exponent laws to break this down so that it's easy to take the derivative. When I looked at h cubed, I said the derivative is 3h squared dh dt, and on the left side for the volume, I just said dv dt. I isolated dh dt, and then I just uh, substitute in the values of h and dv dt to give me the rate at which the height is changing. Okay, so this is how related rates uh, typically work. So I hope this is good. And now let's look a bit at one optimization example. So optimization is about trying to maximize or minimize one variable with respect to another variable. So in calculus, we ask the question, where do maximum and minimums typically occur? So draw two functions, one with a max and one with a minimum. Well, at the maximum and at the minimum, we see something that they have in common, that at both uh, places, the slope of the tangent is zero. Slope of tangent equals zero. 
and slope of the tangent is another name for derivative. So when we're trying to find out where a particular function has either a max or a min, so in this case let's pretend we have an x and y axis here, we will say well the, the value of x that makes y into a max or a min is where uh, the slope of the tangent is zero. And then we ask one further question. How do we know which of the two it's going to be? Right? A derivative of zero doesn't tell you which, uh, whether it's going to be a max or a min. It just tells you it's going to be one of the two. And that's where we have the second derivative test. So there's a second derivative test. And this is what it tells you. Second derivative test. Right, it's going to tell you that you need to do one extra step to figure out whether it's a max or a minimum. And here it is. It says if the value of a derivative is zero at the point C and its second derivative at that same point is positive. Okay, so if this is telling, telling you horizontal tangent and this is telling you concave up. So what happens if you combine concave up with a horizontal tangent? You just get a minimum value. And if you were to combine a horizontal tangent, zero derivative, and combine that with a second derivative that's negative, and that would mean concave down, then you will have actually found a maximum. Okay, so that's one way we can uh, do this. And if you don't like this, no problem at all. There's actually another way of doing this. And it involves the first derivative test. I mentioned the second derivative test because often it's quite easier. Okay, but there's also a first derivative test. And this one, uh, let's draw a picture to see what it's telling us. Right? It says if you have a function, the derivative is 0 at x equals c, but that to the left of x equals c, the derivative is positive, and then to the right of x equals c, the derivative is negative. So we go from a positive slope to a negative slope. Right? There's a positive slope. And here we have a negative slope. Then you can see that it's a maximum. And if you had the reverse, then it would be a local minimum. Right? So if you were working at x equals c, and you found a negative derivative on the left, and then a positive derivative on the right side. So let's do this. Positive derivative. Then you will have found a minimum. So that's how that's how they are. You can use either one on any problems, but you just have to know both in case one of them is more convenient than the other. Okay? So more details on that will be provided in my review session, but now let me just go through and do an example with optimization. So let's say we have 400 squared centimeters of a piece of cardboard and we're trying to make a box that has an open top and a square base. Find the dimensions that will produce the largest possible box. So let's draw a picture. I want to make a box with a square base. So square base tells you that your dimensions in the base are the same. So I can just call this x, call this x too. And the height, we can just call it h. And uh, they're telling me that the surface area is 400 square centimeters. Okay, so let's, let's come up with the expression for surface area and make it equal to 400. So surface area is the area of all of the sides. So there's the front, there's the back, and we have the four sides. Sorry, front, 
there's the front there's uh, the back and so let's just do it like this there's the bottom there's the and then there's like the four sides right the bottom has area of x squared and there are four sides and you can see there is the front here then there is this side here there is the back and there's the left side that uh, that we can't really see so each of those you have to think about their areas so the very front the area is x multiplied by h this side right here the area is x multiplied by h also it's the same for the back and it's the same for the left side so each of those has area x h and there are four of them all four of them have the same area so x squared plus 4xh equals 400, right? It's asking me for the largest possible box, which means maximum volume. Volume for this shape is x times x times h or x squared h. As I mentioned in the beginning of this lesson, that you need to break down an optimization question into just simply two variables. Because you're trying to optimize volume, right? You want to make volume into the largest possible with respect to a single variable. Which variable will this be? And it's up to you. You just have to do the algebra correctly. So let's have a look at the surface area equation. Which of these variables it, would it be easiest to isolate so that you can replace it? So think about, it. do you have x squared and you have an x, or you just have an h term in, in one of the places? So it will be easier to isolate h. So let me do that for you. So you move over the x squared, and then you divide both sides by 4x. There we go. So now I can actually say, that I'm going to try to maximize the volume with respect to the variable x. Okay, so I can remove the one variable here and call it x. I'm going to try to vary x so that uh, I can see where x is that's going to produce the largest volume and calculus tells us that's where the derivative of volume with respect to x will be zero. Again, here if you want to get these questions right, you have to take a bit of time, invest your time into simplifying the equation before you take the derivative. So I'm going to multiply in the x squared, and then I'm going to separate this into two fractions. I don't want to use a quotient rule. You can do that, but again, you will likely make mistakes at some point. Look at this, 100x minus 1 quarter x cubed. Right, for those of you that are weaker in math, you might want to do this in two steps. You might want to say x to the 3 on top of 4, but then recognize that this is the same as 1 quarter x to the 3. Okay? Now this will be so easy to differentiate. So I can say v prime equals 100 minus 1 quarter 3x squared. We are not using implicit differentiation anymore. Right? x just depends on x. It doesn't depend on time. So it wouldn't make sense for me to say dx dt right x doesn't depend on time x just depends on x and the volume depends on x so at this point you could uh it's it's up to you you could say v prime and some of you might like to say dv dx it's really up to you but v prime is just it's more it's preferred by the majority of students okay let's now simplify this And now, we again, we've said from calculus that the derivative is 0 at the max or minimum. So v prime equals 0 at 
max or minimum points. So 0 equals 100 minus 3 over 4x squared. Multiply everything by 4. Quite important here. Again, to just make your life easier. Multiply everything by 4. 4 times 0 is 0. 4 times 100. 4 times 3 over 4 is 3. Rearrange. Take the square root. Square root of 400 is 20. So you get 20 over the square root of 3. There we go. So we have found now two dimensions. The dimensions of the base, right? We said it's a square base. So we have 20 over root 3. The only thing that's left is for me to find h, but that's not a problem because I have an expression for h in terms of x. Right? So now I can say that h is equal to 400 minus 20 over square root 3 squared on top of 4 times 20 over root 3. Okay, at this point it's just simplifying. You just simplify your expression and then you will have found the dimensions that make the volume into a maximum. So I hope to see all of you at our review session. Uh, I will be doing questions like these and going over all sorts of topics including antiderivatives and uh, anything else that you need to know for the final exam.